everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I have educator Devin Vidichka, and I've been practicing his name before uh, we started recording. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And he actually has a new book out with Impress. That's uh, our publishing company. And it's called Learner Centered Leadership. It, and I have read it before, obviously, but I just read it again. And it's an incredible book and it's incredible stories and really also practical ideas, really improving innovation. So Devin, thank you so much for, for joining me today. I know that everyone's super busy and I know honestly, everyone's kind of zoomed out as well too. Like uh, I saw someone, you know, comparing zoom to like the Muppets and all the, you know, I kind of feel like that sometimes, but uh, thanks. Thanks for being on today. And Devin, if you could just kind of tell a little bit about who you are and, and you know, a little bit about your educational journey, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's a privilege to connect and uh, happy to share a little bit. Uh, so, I mean, I, I guess I would start way back, uh, you know, with my childhood being a, a kid of immigrants. My dad's Czech, my mom's Dutch. A lot of people ask about my name. You know, Devin Vodichka is a little unusual. Uh, the last name Vodichka is Czech. Uh, and my dad, obviously being Czech, uh, that is the same word as vodka. So vodka I was wondering, I was going to say vodka when I read it, That's right? right. Yeah. Vodka is Russian, Bodichka is Czech, uh, and it means little water. Boda is water, and the Ichka makes it the diminutive. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, as a school leader, I, you know, I've, I've uh, had the privilege of being a principal and district leader and superintendent and now supporting schools uh, all over the place. Uh, having a name like Devin Vidichka, you know, when you type it in, it, the spell checker turns it into devil vodka. So I always had to be very careful in my, you know, like newsletters or messages going out to family, <laughs> make sure I, I corrected the name. Yeah, but spell check is not always our friend, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, you know, growing up as a uh, uh, first generation American in a small town in Northern California, I really felt like a, an outsider a lot of the time uh, and, you know, felt like uh, the culture that I had, which was very important to my family, was was just invisible uh, in the school experience. And there's so many other parts of uh, our identities that is uh, just invisible in the uh, traditional school experience. Uh, and so even as a kid, I, I always wondered how we could think about a more humane type of educational system that would really see and know and, and, and value the differences that we each have uh, as learners. And so that's been my, my path uh, since being a kid. Both my parents were computer teachers. I went into teaching and school administration and, and have had this idea that there's a better way to just build on what's unique about every uh, every one of us as individuals and have tried uh, through my career to find ways to shift in the direction of a empowering learning experience for all kids. Yeah. And that, that really resonates with me, Devin, and especially because we were talking before the connection, you know, my parents both immigrated to Canada. They met, um, you know, in a small town, like I, I was talking to Devin before this, his family went to San Francisco, nice, you know, climate. My parents went to Humboldt, Saskatchewan, Canada, where it was like minus 40. I'm like, why did they go to California? But neither here nor there now. But I'm, I'm glad to have grown up in such an awesome community. But as I'm listening to you, uh, I always talk about this because there's always this balance of like, we want kids to explore their passions. But we also sometimes have to like kind of step in and say like, this is necessary to learn too, right? Yes. And the one, the one thing as I'm listening to you, I was thinking about that is probably one of my biggest regrets is that I don't want to speak Greek. And mm -hmm. my, my sister, who's, you know, uh, 16 years older than me, she speaks gr better Greek than my parents. It's weird, right? She's very fluent. And the reason why I bring that up is because I remember specifically saying to my mom, don't talk Greek to me. It's embarrassing. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the, I, the one thing I didn't want to celebrate, you know, my culture, you know, my, my, my parents' culture, I wanted to just be the same. Right. And, mm -hmm. and then, and then like, what did I lose as a kid? So like, 
it just it really resonate with me. Is there, you know, kind of thinking like, as you talk about that, like, how do we actually help our kids, you know, feel more comfortable, you know, appreciating their own, you know, their own backgrounds. Cause I think that's something to me is really important, you know, obviously from both of our upbringings. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, I mean, it's a process. Uh, right. As an adult, I'm still getting to know who I am uh, as, as a person. Uh, but where I've seen the most success is where we create opportunities for students to get to know who they are. Uh, and there are projects like doing a family history project that can be very empowering, uh, that uh, don't take a lot of time, uh, but that help each of us to you know get to know our uh, family background and 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 the the stories of our grandparents and great grandparents mm -hmm. and others uh, and everyone's got incredible stories uh, not just first generation Americans but you know everyone right. has incredible Obviously. stories in their family uh, and there's a lot of research that shows that if you just know your family story you are much more likely to have a high level of ownership and pride in that identity uh, and so that's that's a very simple thing that we can do. Mm -hmm. But there's also great power in uh, lots of different types of self-assessments. I'm a big believer in understanding our strengths, our interests, and our values, uh, and finding ways to identify what energizes each of us as individuals through these self-assessments and then testing out a variety of different experiences. That's also a very, very empowering uh, uh, process for, for each of us. Yeah, we had... Um... When I was a kid, I remember we had a, like it was, it was like, it was called Folk Fest. And I know people know Folk Fest is kind of like folk music. And, but it was tied to an event that happened um, in a city near me. And it was like, we would come and, you know, bring food from like, you know, you know, our families. And it was like a really great thing. And uh, as a kid growing up, it's something I really appreciated. And I remember, you know, some of my friends trying Greek food for the first time. And then all of a sudden saying, oh, that's kind of cool that you're mm -hmm. right. And they, it was like a good way for us to share that with others. And as you said, kind of, you know, share our story. And one of the stories that you actually share, I really resonated with me. And it was actually about a specific student name. Uh, I think is, is it Diego? Am I saying it correct? Yep. That's not his real name, but that's the name we use. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I thought that was really uh, powerful. And I felt when I was reading that, like we always talk about, you know, students, you know, making an impact on us as adults. And I felt as I'm reading that the significant impact that experience had had, had on you. So can you, yeah. um, can you share a little bit about that story and kind of the, what it did for your trajectory as a, you know, as a school leader? Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, there was this kid, uh, he, he's a young man now, but he, um, <clears throat> he had been a, a student at the school where I was a principal uh, when I was an elementary school principal. And when I was superintendent, I was superintendent in a neighboring district and, and he had moved uh, into the district where I was now superintendent. And so I knew him as a, a really little kid. Uh, and then when I would visit this high school, <clears throat> I would see him there and we would reconnect and, and you know, talk about how much fun uh, it had been back when he was at the elementary school level. I didn't know him that well, just, you know, had this uh, connection with him from being little and, and being uh, uh, able to check in with him every now and then at the high school. And one day I got a call from his mom and she explained that, uh, and you gotta forgive me if I get, yeah. you know, emotional on this, but, <clears throat> uh, every time it gets me. Uh, uh, <clears throat> his dad had died and she was sick and he was, uh, he was working 40 hours a week to try to support the family. And just give me a second. <clears throat> Take your time, Devin. Uh, he was close to dropping out of school. And the mom didn't know what to do. So uh, as soon as we knew that that was his situation, we were able to put a whole lot of supports into place. 
help him to graduate. He went on to college. He's doing great now. Uh, but I think about how close we were to just losing him. And I think that's one of the things that I appreciate about your work, and I know it ties into mine, is that the, the idea of learner-centered, like knowing who our kids are, you know, knowing their stories, knowing how we can, you know, bring out the best in them and some of the challenges that they are facing. And I have, and I, I, I know I talk about this quite a bit for people that listen to my podcast. I feel the obsessive focus on, on data and numbers actually does sometimes lead to losing kids in because there's so much more to that story. And I'm not, and I've, I never have said, don't use that. I've never said, don't look at numbers, but mm -hmm. when I can just easily quantify a, a kid into some measurable standard, then those stories are more likely to happen. And, and, and to be honest with you, when we are use those metrics all the time to equate whether we're successful or not as a school, mm -hmm. it's easier to, see we're like 95% proficient and not really see the damage that the other 5% have had. And so like, I appreciate you sharing that. And yep. like after, so after that experience and seeing that, like what, what shifted in you, like what shifted in, in your work? Cause I know yeah. like we, I always talk about these trajectory changing moments and it can yeah. tell and your passion and, and yeah. how you share that story. Mm -hmm. Like what, what changed in you and you know, what, what turned out to be better because of that story? Yeah, I mean, so much of it is about, uh, you know, the system that we have uh, is, is unflinching and, and, you know, it's designed based on this industrial mode of assembly line production and every kid gets kind of the same thing in the same way. Uh, and, you know, the, there are good reasons why that system was was put into place, but it doesn't recognize uh, the 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 variation that exists in our identities. It also doesn't recognize the variation that exists just in our context. And so, the in Diego's experience, here's a kid who was on track uh, his whole school career until he had a lot of adversity, uh, and the system didn't flex to support right. him in that uh, moment. And so it, it just reinforces the need to be humane and to be learner centered, to really know every one of our kids, to, to slow down, to take the time to listen to them, to understand what their experience is like. Uh, and when I talked to Diego about his situation, said, why didn't you reach out? Uh, he, he said, you know, he didn't know how to reach out. He didn't know uh, and he didn't want to disappoint his teachers. He didn't want to disappoint his parents. Uh, and so we as the adults have to take the step to create the space for those conversations to happen. We can't expect that a kid is going to know how to articulate their needs uh, precisely at any given moment. Uh, and so, you know, a big shift for me was thinking about how do we create a system that creates that space for every kid to be able to articulate who they are and where they are in time and space uh, so that they can know themselves, but also exist in a community that's supporting one another. Um, and uh, we saw that those changes starting to take place as we put systems into place to, to listen to kids. Yeah, was, I'm wondering, Devin, as I'm listening to you with like, we're recording this, obviously it is the middle of May still, you know, people are, kind of getting to the point, like I felt with all the pandemic stuff at the beginning, doing something different as terrifying as it was, there was like a adrenaline rush. Um, now there's seemingly this exhaustion that's kind of kicking in and you know, also the uncertainty of next year, right? Like what does September look like for a lot of these schools? But I'm wondering, you know, the flexibility that you're talking about to really meet the needs of students like are you seeing that right now with what people are doing like i feel that some of the um things that are some of the things that are really bad about the system and i know we can always do better and there's stuff that we can address right now but i i feel there's this really learner-centered 
you know, a focus right now. I mean, I don't, I like, are you seeing that at all? Like some of the things, you know, and maybe why, like, I, yeah. I know that I'm seeing it. So like, what do you think the change is right now? Well, I think the, the crisis that we're in this global pandemic mm -hmm. <clears throat> is um, revealing the need to support the whole child and the whole family. Uh, and so we're seeing systems and schools uh, recognize that uh, we have to ensure that kids are safe, take care of, uh, in some cases, basic needs like food and shelter, mm -hmm. uh, mental health supports. Uh, we're seeing that having access to digital devices and connectivity is essential when you're physically separated. <clears throat> so I think schools and systems are doing a good job trying to fill those needs. What I see then is uh, schools taking two separate paths. Sometimes they're trying to replicate this factory model, uh, you know, with like seat-based attendance, even though you can't come to school. And I see other schools saying, how can we uh, take advantage of the flexibility that is required uh, in this moment? How can we really co-design with each learner, uh, create engaging authentic learning experiences that empower them? Uh, and so I think there's, there are some great things happening right now. And there yeah. are also some, some really, um, uh, some things that, that, that won't last because they're just not, not working. Uh, yeah. And I think, I think as you go through it, you're, it's, it's kind of the idea of your, we have a new thing, but we're trying to fit the old practice into the new thing, as opposed to really redesigning and thinking about like what we're able to do. And I know the thing that I've been talking about quite a bit, I know that you focus on, obviously in this, you know, in our conversation today, but in the book is really kind of focusing on the, the whole child. And mm -hmm. I was actually watching, it was funny. I was watching a, a TikTok of a kid who is, his name is Snarky Marky. And he, he kind of like talks like how teachers talk and he's, mm -hmm. you know, and he was saying about, it was a, he was joking about a teacher losing it on a kid, not showing up to zoom on time, seven minutes late. And the thing that the video was really interesting to me, you know, thinking like, does that actually happen? But then I read the comments and like, you know, a lot of young people on TikTok, a lot of students, and they're talking about, you know, like I, you know, I haven't been to class in a while. I haven't, you know, I haven't done this. And if my teacher talked to me, I, I just shut the computer right away. And like, that's happening right now is that kids actually do have like we always say if kids had a choice and now they do mm -hmm. and parents said be like if you don't value me i'm i'm out like i have no idea what are you gonna do right mm -hmm. you can't come to my house so i'm just going to to leave and I, I just thought the comments um were really interesting in in how they connected but the when we talk about like the system and the ideas of what we're doing the thing that I noticed when I was reading your book, and I appreciate you sharing this, you're, you, is it Vista? Am I saying it right? That yeah. you were at? I, when I was reading through, you're talking about this really holistic focus on the learner, focus on who they are, um, how important that is. But you also showed that once you actually shared that focus, that you're actually, your scores went up and people kind of, see it as an either or mm -hmm. and whereas yeah. i actually see if you focus on actually the learner the, the scores yeah. tend to go up because you have people more excited to be there people valued people are willing to go through tougher times like so like is there do you see that the the approach actually while we still have these metrics that you know many schools have to report on does mm -hmm. this approach do you see this as actually improving like improving that or like wh what do you see the connection there yeah i i i uh, I appreciate what you're saying in that a lot of people think that it's a, a dichotomy that you right. can either be relational and support the whole child, or you can focus on, uh, academic achievement. And my experience is that, you know, when the pendulum swings too far one way or the other, there are all kinds of challenges, but we, we tend to think that learning takes place just in the head, focus on academics and try to just optimize it by doing more of the same but faster and better and that only gets you so far 
what I've seen is that when you take a whole child approach and you empower learners to see and own and drive their learning, they not only do better in terms of their connectedness, their engagement, their persistence, but their achievement also goes up to mm -hmm. higher rates than, than uh, you know, you saw before. And there's a very, I'm a data guy. I love data and statistics and I, mm -hmm. I track this stuff, uh, you know, meticulously. And, and there's a very common pattern when schools or classrooms make this shift where academic achievement starts to go down initially. Uh, and what I call engagement metrics like attendance and discipline right. and attitudes about school, they get better. And uh, if you only look at that academic achievement short term, you tend to go back to what is known and comfortable and you, you plateau. But if you believe that if students persist and they have good attitudes about school and that they're uh, engaging more, that that eventually will translate to higher achievement, that is what happens. And so there's a little bit of an implementation dip, but then there's a massive jump in academic achievement if we persist through that change process. And if you, if you actually didn't provide me numbers on this, I would believe that. Like, so, and here's why I say that. So you're telling me that if you value me more, you know who I am, and ultimately makes me want to show up more, then of mm -hmm. course the scores are going to go up. Like it's a pretty easy thing, mm -hmm. right? And I like I, as I'm listening to you, like I'm wondering, like in some places that like this, it's a struggle still. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's like we have a bunch of people that hate, that hate kids, mm -hmm. but I feel you know it's partly how we talk in leadership. Mm -hmm. I think a large part of it too, right? Like when we say relationships are important, but all we talk about is numbers. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times that drives the way we teach because we're like, okay, hey, like I really love these kids, but you know, I, I do need to keep my job and they're, they're making sure that we do this, mm -hmm. this and that. Um, but I also think sometimes we see it as a, a time suck to spend that time getting to know kids. And even, you know, in these virtual settings, um, you spending time to connect with kids. I actually, before I talked to you, I connected with a grade four class that I never knew. They just invited me in. They were talking about speaking and writing and I had a blast and it was like, we got it to the stuff they wanted to ask me, but I tried to do my best to make personal connections and mm -hmm. talk to students. And it was cool. Just, just amazing. And so mm -hmm. I think always for me, that's just an investment of time. And one of the concepts that was very new to me, I never heard that. And uh, I like the terminology and I think that the relationship and the core and the, you know, really that holistic focus really lends to this. As you talk about like ladders uh, versus not learning. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you talk about the difference between those two and kind of like why they matter? Yeah. Uh, so when we think about the different ways in which we learn, there are all kinds of learning theories uh, and, I'm a big fan of schema theory. I'm a big fan of, of, of uh, uh, lots of these abstract uh, concepts. But if you try to operationalize them in practice, it helps to have analogies. And so I came up with this analogy that some learning is like climbing a ladder. It's, there's a linear progression. You move from rung to rung to rung. Mm -hmm. And you basically need to, to stay on that path in order to get uh, to the top of the ladder. Uh, an example would be, you know, it's really hard to multiply two digit numbers if you can't multiply a one digit number. Right. Uh, and, and so a lot of learning conforms to this linear progression. But there is also a lot of learning that is nonlinear uh, and where there's more than one right answer and more than one way to get to a, a better answer or a better uh, approach. So I use the analogy there of it's more like a knot. There's lots of different ways that you can potentially mm -hmm. unwind a knot uh, and, and many possible solutions. And I think we, 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 we sometimes confuse one for the other and we try to create an experience for students uh, that, uh, you know, tries to get them to conform to one path or one right answer when in fact it should be more open-ended, more complex. Uh, and sometimes we do the opposite. And so, I think as a leader and I think as a, an educator, it's, it's helpful to know uh, what outcomes we're trying to achieve and, and how we can organize ourselves uh, to help students address either those linear progressions through ladder types of learning 
or the more complex open-ended types of problems like knots. Yeah, and I think as we go, you know, right now, um, one of the things I'm seeing is the, the comfort level of switching a direction um, to, to actually create something successful is happening more as opposed to like continuously pushing in the same direction when you know it's not working. You know, I kind of think of that, you know, kind of that ladder knot analogy is really shifting. And I'm watching people do that because, you know, it's imperative. We have limited time with our students and embracing that messiness, right? Like when I think of the analogy of what you're talking about, I think of basically like a textbook, right? We throw a textbook in front of a kid. It is so beautifully laid out, nicely, you know, set out for us. And then the learning is just go to the next page, right? Go mm -hmm. to the next page. Right. But that's not really a lot of the work that we do in our lives right now, um, mm -hmm. and especially in this time. And, and so kind of talking about this, you know, there, there's so many unknowns, there's so many messy things that are happening in our world right now. Um, as you look at this and you talk about the idea of learner-centered leadership, like what, what would you say is some of like the best advice you could actually give to educators kind of going through this time right now? Yeah, well, uh, sort of building off of what you're saying, uh, problems that have one right answer that can be solved in a linear progression are going to be better solved by machines than by right. people. Uh, and we are in a time where we, uh, we have an adaptive challenge uh, as humanity. Uh, and so for learner-centered leaders, the, the, there's, a, there's a temptation to go to the one right answer and to think that we can stamp out some type of a technical solution. That's not where we are as a society. That's not where we need to be. We need to be uh, thinking about this as a not, as a complex problem, as a complex challenge. And the way to solve a complex challenge is to come together, to get to know one another, uh, to ask who cares about this challenge, uh, to see what's possible, to apply uh, a, a sense of possibility uh, instead of you know, getting uh, dragged down by all the challenges and boundaries out there. Uh, and to orient to action and to, to, to together take steps in the direction of, of building a brighter future. And I think that's when we, I think both you and I have this focus that innovation is, is like a human driven endeavor. It's not about, it can be involving technology, but it's never about it. Right. And the innovations that I'm watching right now um, created by educators have been blowing me away. And I think, really ties into that idea of, of learner-centered leadership. And so uh, I just want to thank you. I, I would actually show everyone a copy of your book, but I live in Canada and it's taking forever for stuff to get here. So I'll just point and hopefully mm -hmm. there is something that pops up of your book. But Devin, um, thank you for sharing your story. Thanks for you know sharing your heart with us. I really mm -hmm. appreciate your stories, but congratulations on the book as well. No, and so thank you. thank you so much for being here today. I hope you have a, a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks, man. Yep.